So hello, my name is Taylor McGee. I'm excited to be kicking off the TEDx symposium today. I'm uh, class of 2023 at the Hampton Sydney College. What I'm here to talk to you guys today about is scientific illiteracy. What I want to start with is a case study in scientific illiteracy, and I want to start talking about um, drunk driving. So drunk driving is something that a lot of people think that they understand. Um, but according to some statistics, uh, about 43% of Americans have admitted to driving drunk. Um, almost 25% of car accidents are caused by drunk drivers. Now, when you first see the statistic, um, probably a lot of people have a lot of different things going through their heads. One of the things that really struck me is that even though they only make up 50, 57% of the population, sober drivers are responsible for 75% of the argument, for 75% of car accidents. Does that mean that we should go down with big sobriety? No, of course not. I'm not advocating for drunk driving. Drunk driving is a horrible thing that kills millions of people, both within the United States and in America across the world, and in the, the worldwide. What I want to talk about today is the kind of argumentation that people can use to justify claims that are viciously false in an attempt to manipulate or control people or uh, political narratives or to generate money. So the way that a lot of this stuff happens is something uh, so here's a breakdown of how this argument works. It is 43% of drivers have admitted to ever driving drunk. It is not the case that 43% of the drivers right now are actually drunk. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, based off what we know of the set of current drivers, it appears to be the case that drunk drivers are far, far, far more dangerous. And the third thing is, is where are the sources? I just spewed the statistic at you without citing any sources. I didn't tell you anything. Now, it turns out all of the, both of those numbers came from legitimate sources, although the 43% statistic was by far the highest I've seen. And a lot of the um, sort of, uh, so, uh, numbers that are estimated are estimated probably put the estimates about 20 to 23% rather than as high as 57. So there are a lot of problems with this style of argumentation. Um, and so my big question is, what kind of equally absurd arguments can people make using this argument style by using statistics without citing that are either false or don't totally represent the facts of the matter? And the other thing is, is that what can people do to take statistics out of context to make, it, to make an argument for something that is just obviously false? So um, the skill that I think really helps combat this problem is what I have termed scientific literacy. Define it as such, an incorrect belief about ideas um, concerning essential scientific concepts or jargon or something like that. Um, and it tends to, it doesn't always, but it tends to um, lead to the promotion of misinformation or propaganda or things that are just obviously false. So I want to list some other examples. So one of the most common examples that we see is that gay men are the only people that can contract, HIV, that can contract HIV AIDS or believe that Darwinism states that we descend from monkeys rather than we have a common ancestor from monkeys, um, or believing that vaccines can cause autism. And this point right here is why the subtitle of my speech is that this is the silent American health crisis. Because I think one of the uh, fields in which the, the problem of scientific illiteracy is the strongest is in the field of healthcare. And so, I want to take a second to talk about what scientific illiteracy is not. And I want to emphasize that this is the single most important point that I will make while I'm up here. Scientific illiteracy is not blameworthy. Let me repeat that. Scientific illiteracy is not your fault. If you found my argument for drunk driving persuasive, that is not on you. Science is an incredibly complicated network of assumptions of beliefs, of arguments. And the one thing that makes a scientist a truly, truly bad scientist, uh, at least in my opinion, is if they shame people for not understanding science. Science is not intuitive, and it's a skill that must be used. And despite the best efforts, of millions of public school teachers who work their butt off to make sure they can provide students with the best education that they possibly can, it is a matter of fact that the American public school system does not value scientific literacy at this point in time. And so demanding that from people is unfair. Most important point of the night, scientific illiteracy is not anyone's fault. So 
Who cares? So I, I, I laid out this problem and I talked about what it is, what it isn't, but why am I up here discussing it? Why is this relevant? Well, the problem is, is the way that this manifests in the actual world. Vaccine hesitancy is something that we see growing. As we try to fight the pandemic, we see lots of people, particularly in disenfranchised and minority communities, who fear the vaccine because scientists have not taken the time to explain them. Some of the most effective pro-vaccination advocacy programs that we started are community-based programs, where they show people the mechanism by which the vaccine works, where they teach people, where they educate people. And so that's just within the frame of the pandemic. What about within society writ large? Well, we see reemergence of potentially deadly but totally preventable diseases. Measles, mumps, rubella, we have one shot for all of those. Measles is the single most infectious disease that we as people have ever come in contact with. And we have a way to prevent it, we have a way to cure it. Whooping cough, pertussis, tetanus, all of these diseases are horrible diseases that kill people every year, but are 100% preventable, more or less, with vaccinations. And so the UNICEF of the United States of America has pointed out that one of the things that's really incredible in a bad sense about the way that scientific and literacy has manifested in modern American society is the reemergence of diseases that we thought we had defeated, that we thought we were better than. One of the other ways this really manifests is in the problem of obesity. We hear all the time, that, oh, two thirds of our children are now obese. Well, the fact of the matter is that the metrics by which we measure obesity are largely insufficient. The, the, the correlation that we have between obesity and a lot of these health problems are founded on the system that are known as the BMI, the Body Mass Index Scale. According to the BMI, I am obese. According to the BMI, lots of people who aren't actually overweight are overweight. And the fact of the matter is, is that the BMI is not totally reflective of the actual physiological health of an individual. Now, the other thing is, is that we have a lot of this stigma associated with obesity. And at this point in the scientific literature, we're starting to realize that a lot of the stigma that's surrounding with obesity might actually play a causative role in the correlation between some of the um, traditional uh, problems that we see associated with obesity and um, obesity itself. And that it might not actually be the physiological condition of being overweight, but at least in part, the um, this kind of socialized stigma associated with going to the doctor, with getting regular healthcare checkups, with um, being able to eat healthy, with feeling shamed by being exercised, that might contribute at least in part to many of the problems we see associated with obesity. So when we're talking about what are the biggest health crises that affect the United States today? What are the biggest health crises that affect the world today? What are the underlying assumptions that I think people make fallaciously is that people are scientifically literate. And if we institute policies, practices in our education systems, in our personal lives, in our family dynamics, in our colleges, to increase scientific literacy, we stand a chance to readily combat a lot of the issues that we as an American society and we as a global society are going to face for the next 10 to 15 years. So what can we actually do? I said, you know, oh, implement policy. What does that look like? Well, what I'm not here to do is argue what government policies you should make your senators vote for, because I don't think that that's really the point of this. The point of this is what can you do as people in the audience? What can you individually do? Because this is the kind of problem that can be handled at an individual level. There are a lot of problems that can't. This is one of them. Read, study, and learn. The fact of the matter is, is that right now, we have basically the sum of human knowledge at our fingertips, which is something that pretty much no other generation has ever been able to claim. There is something so fundamentally cool about that, impressive about that, unique about that, but it comes at a price. It comes at the price of misinformation, of propaganda, of lying, of deceit. And what you need to do is you need to read, you need to study, you need to learn, you need to understand why other people believe what they believe, even if they're wrong. You need to be able to promote a position of why somebody that you disagree with believes what they believe better than they can. This is what's important. This is what it means to be scientifically literate, to understand what other people are saying 
and why they're wrong if you believe that to be sufficient. And so I want to challenge everybody who's in the audience today that if even for a second you found my argument for drunk driving persuasive, to go back and build me a case, prove me wrong, motivate my argument for me, show me what, what I did wrong, and then prove me wrong, nail the, the, the nail into the coffin by bringing up statistics, studies, show me why I'm wrong. And then what I want you to do is I want you to think of other things that you believe. What do you believe that science disagrees with? And then I want you to figure out why science believes that. Why do scientists believe vaccines are good? Why do scientists believe ivermectin is an effective treatment for uh, COVID-19? Why do scientists believe fill in the blank? Be able to pr promote an argument there for their position and then prove them wrong. Thank you.